Friends, <clears throat> hello again, and thanks for coming back. We're, try, we're going to try to work with uh, some of the um, uh, errors people make while dealing with variables from Extremistan and applying standard statistical techniques to them. A particular um, uh, bullshit production ha is, can be linked to the notion of violence. Did violence drop? And the question is, did violence drop based on the data? Have we experienced something we can call the long piece? No. We cannot make such a claim. Violence may have dropped, but not. we cannot establish that based on the data and you cannot make a statistical claim. The law of large number doesn't work very well in Extremistan. So let's see um, uh, how it links to everything we've been working on in the past dozen lectures, a little more than a dozen lectures, okay? Steven Pinker had a theory, actually. He didn't even uh, bother to establish that violence has dropped. His point is, his subtitle of a book with a weird title is why violence has dropped. And of course, you produce all kinds of psycho BS theories on rationality and stuff like that. Okay, institutions, all, all kind of bullshit. Hinges <laughs> upon whether violence did or did not drop. We can't establish that. There can be arguments that effectively violence is probably on the rise. <laughs> But you cannot scientifically make a claim in Extremistan that way. There are other problems with uh, Pinker and Pinker's book. Not only he explains that Y violence has dropped, data is BS, 100 data points, but he makes claims that someone else, Richardson, supposedly made that Richardson didn't make. So if it were a scientific paper, of course, it would be retracted. But it's not a scientific paper. But let, so let's let's forget about uh, uh, Pinker and let's focus on uh, on on how people bullshit in Extremistan uh, by using wrong statistical method. There are two papers linked to violence: one technical in statistical consequence of fat tails with Pasquale Cirillo, another one also with Pasquale. <laughs> Uh, non-technical that we uh, gave and we published uh, with the Nobel Commission, the people who give the Nobel Peace Prize, not, not the scientific Nobel, uh, scientific or literary Nobel. The, the, uh, and, and it's explained clearly with all the methodology for uh, quantitative historiography. Because there are effectively some difficulties we encountered. Uh, luckily, we found ways around them. So, uh, mediocre stand versus extreme stand. Let's recap difference. Mediocre stand, extreme stand. And number of observation, however you want to define n. So, you don't need a very large n to make a claim. Mediocre stand means a class of distributions that are thin tailed and on the summation converge to the Gaussian basin very quickly. So we both, we saw how the law of large number works, how central limit works. Now this one here, you need a large n or a very large n or an infinite n because the n we use in statistics and that's exactly the whole, you know, uh, point of statistical consequences of fat tails for uh, quantitative estimators and, that, and for confidence intervals and all of that. The n you need here is re required to be much, much larger, <laughs> much larger than with here. So claims made based on mediocre stand are going to be BS, like we cannot compare car accidents to pandemics. <laughs> We had that fight before with another Pinker, okay? Actually smarter than Pinker, I would say, a little more sophisticated, but still who made that mistake. And let's see, well, 
how we approach the problem and what we can learn from uh, working with such an issue. The, the, the first, uh, oh, the, let me give you the result, okay? The result, simply, let's take uh, the, uh, the, the history and let's define events in terms of exceedance Twenty million and fifty million events that kill more than twenty million or more than fifty million in normalized to today. In other words, it's twenty million in today's population. If the population is ten percent, which was happened a couple of thousand years ago, then it would be two million uh, and be five, fifty million. How long, on average, does it take? How long on average does it take for such a random event to occur? Okay, so in other words, the mean inter-arrival time. 20 million, for 20 million, it takes about 50 million, 50 years. That's the mean arrival time between such events. And for this, it's about 70 million. 70 years, sorry, okay? So it takes 70 years for such, on average, for such an event to occur. So to make a statistical claim, of course, you need uh, to work with the variance. This is a, a exponential distribution. So, uh, of course, you need a multiple of that, say at least a century or a century and a half to be able to make a claim that events of more than 20 million, killing more than 20 million people, all right, are no longer taking place. And for this one, between 140 and 200 and some years. So you know that you cannot make a claim that violence has dropped. Violence is extremely fat-tailed. Okay, so we were lucky that events are memoryless. And you can see that if you take the autocorrelation function, you notice that it's pretty much noise, okay? So that events don't occur, um, that having an event does not predict having another one. And these events, again, are defined in the S-tail events, 50 million, 20 million, 10 million, compared to today's population. That's proportion to today's population. That's first point. Second point, we have to be very careful about the definition of the event. This is zero, this is today, time, magnitude of events. So you had the Andushan rebellion in China as a very big event in Pinker Singh. And then you had about the 20th, 30, the, the 12th to 13th century, you had the Mongolian invasion. The problem, okay. The problem is that <clears throat> Is that historians are now revising that that event did not kill as much as was claimed. It's at least an order of magnitude lower. What happened with, with the, is that they had miscalculated the population drop in China based on tax records. And you know what happens during civil war or during rebellions. Tax collectors, they hide, they stay home, or they're killed. Here's the Mongolian invasion, they find that one single event, and that event spans more than two centuries. No, 
you have you can't you know it's like you you you, you add the uh, first war second war and the first great war second great war and uh, the franco-prussian war of 18 uh, of this mark 1870s as a single event you can't okay you have to break back down if you adjust then you see that visually uh, there's such effect is not visible <sighs> Other problem, is the BS by historians. When you make claims, you want to make sure that they are uh, uh, robust to errors in reporting. So, and this is a random variable. Okay, say so x runs through xn. We had more than 500. We took x1 low and x1 high for each one of them, the low estimate and the high estimate. For instance, you have the French estimates of the Algerian uh, War of Independence, much, much lower than the Algerian estimate. You know what? We took both. So we constructed 100,000 time series, either taking the low and the high, you know, you can build a lot of time series based on that, or uh, randomizing, okay, or you, you have uniform random variable between the two. So we had synthetic histories, 100,000 synthetic historical paths. And it's very hard to explain to historians that are working with synthetic history to establish statistical confidence. But our point is that whatever we obtain, result we obtain, must hold across these 100,000, mostly 100,000 sample paths as some kind of bootstrap. And effectively, our results hold. When we estimate parameters, the difference is minimal across paths. You have a pretty much a Gaussian distribution for a parameter across all of these paths. So, and why did we do that? For us, it's a very important exercise in quantitative historiography. When I was a kid, and I know when I was a kid, it was uh, 1982, a, an event took place in Syria when Assad, supposedly the father, killed at the time, what was estimated to be between 2,500 and 3,000 people. <clears throat> but Assad had a vested interest in uh, creating fear, just like the, the same thing with, uh, with, uh, with Genghis Khan. They, you create fear, so it doesn't cost you <laughs> a lot to establish control. So there was a, you know, he didn't mind if people inflated that number. And effectively, that the estimate by the U.S. Uh, the military intelligence was about some level park. So, but that number kept growing over time, with people adding to it while transmitting it. So, there's an inflation. With no information, that number moved from less than three thousand to thirty-eight thousand last time I checked. <laughs> The problem with historiography is that we need to integrate that because nobody was there watching, counting the bodies in the Peloponnesian War. So you need to find something robust by saying, okay, if you take an estimate by one party and uh, another one by the opposing party. And sometimes when you don't have that, you just can fudge. You can throw in a number here and see does it affect the total result. And, uh, you know, uh, what we found was robust to these. And as well as other perturbations. Okay, you remove a very large event. So our parameters will change. No, you move a lot of small events. The parameters will change. No. So this is how we worked with, uh, with violence. Finally, there's a technical problem is that we're not dealing with a power law. For a power law, 
you need to be between a number and uh, an infinity, okay? The, the, the random variable needs to have support, you know, uh, maybe on one, on one tail, uh, uh, it's finite, the other one should be infinity. We're working with low and high. So you can't have a power law here. What did we do? We did uh, some modification, some uh, log transformation to the data, and, uh, and we're able to work with a non-power law that has the property of power law under transformation. The point is technical, uh, but we're, we're happy uh, having, uh, you know, developed it at a time because we used it again for um, in finance for operational losses by banks, non 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 market related, but you know errors and stuff like that, and for uh, pandemics. <laughs> it turns out to be the same problem and the same thing, and we published. Uh, a paper uh, Cirillo, Pasquale Cirillo and I on the properties of pandemics in history. Fatter tail than wars. And if I were to establish a scale, fatter tail is pandemics, wars, maybe financial derivatives is here, finance in general is here, maybe size of cities is here, but it's very fat tailed but not as a tailor pandemic. Thank you for listening to me and have a great day. Bye now.